Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Monday, February 26th. We are here live. It's time for a free-for-all. We're going to open those phone lines right now, so start dialing. Anything goes. If you've got a question, a comment, a topic, anything at all you want to talk about, pick up the phone and join me. 855-950-3835. You can also hit the call now button in your app. That'll get you in here as well. We'll get to those calls here in just a little bit. So line them up. At the bottom of the hour, I'll be joined by Brent Hutto. We'll be talking about uh, what's going on in the marketplace. Brent from truckstop.com. We'll see what's going on with rates, volumes, and uh, all that good stuff. If you've got questions for Brent, you could line those up as well. A um, couple things. One, uh, it's tax time. Really should be getting your tax information done by now. The sooner, the better. I know I say that all the time, but uh, I usually file an extension every year. Even though we do, our taxes are usually, if not done, they're about 99% done anyway. But <clears throat> get it done. You know, even if you want to pay the bill on the 15th and file the extension, but, but get the majority of your taxes done now. The sooner you do it, the better off you are. And I can give you a really simple, powerful way to get your numbers together and won't even cost you anything. Obviously, if you're a Profit Gages member, you already have the ability. And if you're doing your Profit Gages every month, which is pretty simple, takes you about 20 minutes a month for one truck. If you are doing that all year, you're already done. You've already got 95% of the work done for your taxes. All you got to do is get the other documents together and you'll be on your way. If you haven't done that, if you're not a member of Profit Gages, the good news is you can join right now on the free trial. It's 30 days. You don't even have to put in your credit card. Just go start a free trial. And then you have full access to the program for 30 days. So there's a couple ways you could do this. One, you can sit down with all of your settlements and receipts and total up everything inside profit gauges and just do it for December. That's the really quick, easy way if you just want to get your taxes done and have some numbers. So you would, you would be able to see the whole year at once if you put it all in in December, but you would still know what your gross revenue per mile was what all of your expenses per mile are for the year, and what your net revenue per mile is. A lot of the numbers we talk about here when people call in and we go over their business reports, you could have all of that. You could get it done in a day or two. It's really not that. Honestly, if all you're doing is putting everything in in December, you could probably get done in about four or five hours. That's if you have nothing done so far. Or you could also take a little more time and you could separate all of your settlements and receipts out by the month for last year we're talking about. And you could make your entries every month. So January, February, March. That will take you a little longer to do it that way. But now you'll have a an entire year's worth of operational data that you can look at. And it really doesn't take long. And like I said, it won't cost you anything. You can do it on the free trial. Now, we do that because we're pretty confident that once you see that, you'll want to start doing it every month the way you should. So head on over there and check that out. Go to letstruck.com. You'll see profit gauges there. Sign up for the trial. If you have any questions about that, give me a call. Uh, I need to check sound. Morgan, is everything sounding okay on the phone system today? And I don't see any calls yet. What's going on? Pick up the phone and join us, 855-950-3835. I'm going to make sure people are hearing me. All right. Looks like everything sounds all right. Okay. No problem, and we're live. Good. All right. So get your accounting done. If you don't have a system, then... Go get a Profit Gages account and get it all totaled up. Then you'll have numbers to start working on as well, which is a big part of what we will be doing in the CMC. Everything I do in the CMC is based around numbers because that's really how you run a business. It really is all about the numbers. 
all the ways over the years <clears throat> that I've developed for improving revenue, decreasing costs. I mean, that's the whole point of business. Bring more money in, spend less to do it, and the difference is yours. That's the profit. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do it by measuring everything. If you don't measure these things, you don't know what works and what doesn't work, whether it's revenue or expenses. We've got to measure what we're doing. If we know that your fuel cost is X, then we can start to work on strategies to lower your fuel cost. If we know your maintenance cost is 22 cents a mile, maybe we set a goal to get it down to 15 and we start working towards it. Remember on expenses, every time you cut an expense by a dollar, that dollar goes right to the bottom line profit. When you increase revenue, that's not a bad thing, but when you increase revenue, only a percentage of that increase makes it to the bottom. And that's another good reason for having these accounting numbers. So you start to understand those things. So when we, and then you'll also know, I think on Friday, um, Alec was using a number of 28% that goes to the bottom line. Well, <clears throat> we may not have made it clear, but that was that particular, I think what um, Alec was actually looking at was ATBS's numbers on their averages. So that's a good place to start. It's a good comparison. But what you really want to do <clears throat> is look at your numbers and how can we improve those. But you would also know, once you're doing the accounting and profit gauges, you would know what percentage of your gross revenue makes it down to the bottom line then you'll know for sure. If I raise my revenue by a dollar, then I'll be able to increase my net by 41 cents or whatever your number is. And then that tells us what we have left. That helps us focus. Do we want to put more time on lowering expenses or increasing revenue? All right. Uh, I had a couple other things, but I, well, you know what? Let me cover these real quick. Um, last week, we had a big AT&T outage, and it was, it was big. Uh, we had people within the company that their AT&T phones stopped working wherever they were. It's odd, though, because I talked to people who maybe had two AT&T phones in the same house or the same office or the same building, and one would be working and one wouldn't. But uh, obviously, a lot of people suffered an outage because I talked to several of them. There was a lot of talk. We also had a big solar flare right around the same time that those outages happened. The problem with that is it doesn't really make sense that it took out primarily AT&T. Early on, there were some reported outages with all the other carriers, but then those seemed to have cleared up. Then the problem was really with AT&T. But like I said, you could have two phones right next to each other. One was working and one wasn't. That is such an odd occurrence. And then there's the theory people were saying, oh, well, they're just saying there was a solar flare because they don't want us to know what it really was. Is, is it a cyber attack by China or Iran or North Korea or whoever, Hamas, the Houthis, whoever? I think that was probably more likely, but the solar flare is interesting. I've talked about this in the past. Solar flares would be really, really dangerous for our modern world. And they are a real thing. This isn't a conspiracy theory. This is a real thing. We know that solar flares happen. They happen all the time. We measure them. I've, I've talked about it. I've got an app called Solar Alert that uh, monitors this kind of stuff. Usually we can predict about three or four days out what's happening. So we could have a massive solar flare that would have no impact on Earth whatsoever. But at some point, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. At some point, everything lines up and that solar flare could have a big impact on Earth. Well, here's what has to happen. That solar flare ejects all kinds of energy. It's like a little explosion on the surface and it's just, it's a massive amount of energy. Now, Remember, the Earth is rotating around the sun and spinning. So now the Earth has to end up in the exact right spot 
around the sun with the, with the direction of the solar flare coming out. The timing has to be perfect so that they hit. And then depending on which way the Earth is facing, whichever part of Earth gets the direct hit will have the worst outcome. And it just depends on the size, the timing, all of those things. What happens, though, this can take out electrical grids. It can take out electronics. We're not really sure because how do you test for something like this? We, we do have evidence of, of the fact that this can happen and affect things electronically. Um, in 1859, I believe, it was called the Carrington Event. And this is exactly what happened. Everything lined up just right. And we got a big blast of solar energy and it took down the telegraph system. That was all we had as far as any kind of electronics go. But we had wired up the whole country for telegraph and it took out, it burned up the equipment, started fires, all kinds of crazy stuff. That's the last really big one that's hit Earth. Now, Last week was really active, and it ended with that event, and then the cell signals went down, and was it because of that? We don't know. But this morning, I've read that same area of the sun has now released another large burst. Uh, In fact, let me get to the numbers here. There's a new sunspot that's been growing rapidly over the weekend, becoming the largest sunspot of solar cycle 25. So when it's a sunspot, we watch that activity. That's not a solar flare, but that's where the solar flare is likely to come from. So this spot is getting bigger and bigger. And the bigger it gets, then when it does release, that's going to be a massive amount of energy. At the moment... It has reached 60% of the size of that solar flare that was responsible for the Carrington event. Now, again, just because it gets that big, it could get bigger than the one for the Carrington event. That doesn't mean we're going to be wiped out by it, but it certainly means we could be. It's just a matter of timing. When does it release? Where's the earth? Which way is it facing? Just seems like there's awful, there's an awful lot of reasons to, uh, Really pay attention and be prepared. We talk about this all the time. And for drivers, I I really harp on this because if you are a thousand or 2000 miles away from home, when this happens, this could be very catastrophic if you're not prepared. So we could talk about that. And of course, CMC, we are less than a month away. It is time to get registered. Our spots are filling up. We only have 200 seats available, and when they're gone, they're gone. We can't add any more. We we already know that. This event is 200 seats. That's it. That is set in stone. Now, what we will be able to do, you will be able to join the full year program after the event, but if you're going to be in Louisville or you want a chance to really see what the whole CMC is about before you sign up for it, then you can just join us in, uh, in Louisville. It's only a $100 ticket. You are going to get an entire day and a half of information. This first event is a huge bargain, but you're also going to get to see if you want to move on to the entire program, which I'll be talking about more. All right, calls are starting to pile up. I want to get to some of these before, uh, before we've got to move on to Brent today. So let's get started. Let's go to Ohio. John, welcome. Yeah, good morning, Kevin. Uh, Just a quick tax question. I had an engine overhaul of $50,000 last year. Can I deduct that whole thing at one time this year, or do I have to spread that out? Well, you have to depreciate it, which is like spreading it out. Because it's go because it's part of the truck, you you'd use the same depreciation schedule you use for a truck, which is three years. So we always start there. That's where you have to start. This is they call this a capital upgrade to the equipment, so it has to be depreciated. Now, once we put it into that depreciation schedule, then we can choose to just take the whole thing up front as it's the rules called section one seventy nine. It allows us to take a whole bunch and just things that we're supposed to depreciate, but we get to take a big allowance up front if you choose. And you can take any amount. 
I mean, you could take 40,000 and then depreciate 10,000. You could take 25 and then depreciate 25. You can take all 50. The way that I decide that when we did tax returns, I would do the entire tax return completely finished, every number plugged in, and then we would decide on depreciation. So let's say that for whatever reason, you don't even have $50,000 worth of net profit. Well, then we don't want to take the whole thing. We, we, let's say you had 42000 in net profit for whatever reason. That's, I know that's really low, but it just helps you to understand the concept. Then we would say, <laughs> okay, we can take 42000 of depreciation, and now we have zero profit, and the 8000 will just get carried forward. Does that all make sense? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, the engine overall was 51000 and I paid cash for it. Some people say, yeah, you can take it because you paid for so, it. Stop year, right there. Stop say, no. right there. That is absolutely 100% false. How you pay okay. for a depreciable item has zero to do with how you depreciate it. The government never asks. They don't care because it has nothing to do with it. The, the, the section 179 deduction right now is up to a half a million dollars, meaning you can buy a half a million dollars worth of equipment, depreciable assets. And if you had a half a million dollars worth of profit, you could take it all at once and wipe it all out. I can do that whether I paid zero down. I went and somebody gave me a loan for a half a million dollars worth of equipment and I put zero down. I still get to deduct the whole thing on my tax return. Or I walked in and paid cash half a million dollars. I still get to deduct it on my tax return. It has nothing to do with it. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's just what I need to know so I I can figure. All right. I appreciate the info. You're welcome. Thanks for the call. So, yeah, that's I I know a lot of tax preparers who will just always, always take the maximum amount of Section 179 deduction because it makes them look good. It's not always the smartest way to do your tax return. Let's go to South Carolina. Terrence, welcome. What's up, Kev? I got a quick question about uh, state tax. So we, me and my brother, you know, we sold my mom's house last year, and then we got to file the taxes for it. That'll be the end of because everything's dispersed pretty much. So I remember you telling me that I just got to find like we both got a copy of it, becoming the executor of the will in twenty. I think it was February of twenty twenty two, and then we sold the house in. April of 2023. So you had said, I got to figure out what the house costs when we assumed, right, the property. The the value of the property on the day it becomes yours is what we call our new basis. And this is a really, really big tax advantage. And, you know, what could happen here is we've got, you know, parents or whatever, that may have bought a house 40 years ago and, you know, obviously paid a lot less for it back then. If they were to have sold that house right before they died, they would have had to have paid capital gains on the entire game. Capital gains, yeah. But yep. when you inherit it, all of that capital gain up to that point actually becomes tax free and your basis gets reset on that day. So let's say that, you know, it was. 50,000 when they bought it whenever and now it's worth 400,000. Well that now when you go to sell it if you sell it for 400,000 and the basis was 400,000 you have no tax at all. Okay. And what's the easiest way to go about how to get that you know like just go like check back in the market at what houses were going for yeah there's uh, there are if you just start searching for historical real estate data you'll start to come up with some number well wait a minute okay wait 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 no 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 today we're all we need to know is the value yeah when it transferred so it shouldn't have been that long ago no i know how much i i bought the house for but i mean i'm sold the house for but i don't know what it was when we assumed the 
the price of that. Yeah, you know that's, what I mean? yeah, but that wasn't that long ago, so you can just go back and look at the market and see what was going on. Okay, Here's yeah, the other said, thing. Well, but, 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 I mean, uh, this, is, this is not an absolute number. The, the, in some ways, this is an opinion. We have to have it appraised by somebody. Somebody has to determine what the value is, and it's basically what it would sell for in the market at that time. But but that's not a okay. I mean that's not a hard number. There, there's some you know leeway okay. in there. As far as we're concerned, we'd like to pick the highest number we think we can get away with. The highest number that it sells for you saying? Yeah, the highest. We want to put the highest value on it as possible when it, when it transfers. Okay. All right. Cool. That helps. All right. I'll let someone else go. Thanks, Kev. All right. You're All welcome. Right. Thanks Thank for you. the call. Let's go this time to Pennsylvania. Danny, welcome to the program. Well, hello again. Hey there. Two weeks in a row here. That's yeah. Good. Um, you're talking about uh, the profit gauges and all that. I know it's for, like, say, a one-truck owner-operator. Now, I know I am just a one-truck owner-operator, but I've got multiple trucks and trailers. So if I put all that in profit gauges it kind of throws off my uh, like on the maintenance the one thing i do like is you got the, the subcategories so i could put individual well hold on but truck, before yeah, well, that's you could use the subcategory but we do have a multi-truck version now the multi-truck version is designed for multiple trucks all kind of out running whereas i don't think that's what's going on with yours yours is just extra equipment you're the only driver so i don't it, it, Go ahead. But it is for right now, but is that something you were talking with Aaron about that last year, but I, I missed part of it. The, the, and, the way the multi-truck version works. Now, you'll still hear me say once in a while, this program really isn't designed for fleets. Here's why I say that, and it could very well be designed for fleets, depending on how much accounting work somebody wants to do. Now, I believe if you have, let me pick a number, 20 trucks or less, that you should absolutely account for every truck individually. The profit for each truck should be separated and calculated individually, and that's what the multi-truck version will help you do. You set up individual trucks and trailers. You track them as one individual truck, so you see the absolute profit and loss. But then the program also gives you a company profit and loss. So you do see them all together, but you also get to see each truck separately. Now, you get up to 100 trucks, and I don't know anybody that actually accounts for everything on each truck separately. But the longer you are able to do that, the better your information becomes. And then you can really pick out those trucks that aren't doing all that well. You know, you can, I, here's one of the problems. As soon as you start running multiple trucks with multiple drivers, there's a chance that one of those trucks is losing money. I mean, absolutely losing money. Like you'd be better off not owning that truck. But a lot of people don't realize that. Right. They look at the business and go, no, I'm doing okay. Well, yeah, you have four trucks that are making money and one that isn't. Why would you keep doing that? Either get rid of it or figure out why it's not making money and make it better. But you can only know that if you're tracking every truck separately. Can I upgrade uh, from? Uh, yes. What? All right. Do I need to call? Uh, That'd be the best uh, way. Support? Or? Yeah. Just call Tribe Care. All right. Well, the reason now I've got that one backup kind of a project show truck working not really work and hauling anything but um, i've still got you know i had that cascadia that's a the money pit for us. i can't even give them things away but i might have a use for it and I, i'm in the volvo here so i wanted to keep everything separate so like you said you can all right this truck's not making money and there's no need to keep running it because you're losing money so that's why i was wanting to know about separating right having the two different accounts or multiple vers- multiple truck versions. So, yeah, right. I, I, well, I will tell out. you this. If you were trying to use mm-hmm. QuickBooks, we've talked about QuickBooks in the past, 
great program, very popular. The big problem in trucking is it won't do cost per mile at all, no matter how hard you try. Another problem with it, if you're a five or 10 truck fleet and you really do want to track each truck separately, good luck in QuickBooks because it is complicated. In ours, it's really simple. You set up a multi-truck account and then you just enter each one and it does all the work in the background for you. Do I call the same number back? Uh, no, no. Tribe care is a different number. You know what though? Let me just, uh, let me, I'll just put you back in the queue and Morgan can just help you right now. Well, let me tell you real quick, uh, January pulling a reefer, uh, spot market. I did, uh, 242 a mile, all miles. Oh, nice. Those are great numbers. I don't think that was too awful bad for <laughs> no. everybody else crying about. No, rates. that's, hey, look, it, that's, it, that's after the carrier. Uh, that's after the carrier took their cut. So that's what yeah. I made. Yeah. So, so in in a in a in a normal year, if we go back five six years, pick any year, that would be fantastic. Those numbers are really strong. The reason it's not quite as exciting as it would have been is because costs are all up too. But those are still really really right. good numbers. I mean, your. You're all in miles, which means we're accounting for your deadhead, going back and forth to the shop, all that stuff, is higher than the average freight rate, significantly higher. That's a, that's a good number. I was pretty happy with it. Yeah, yeah, good job. All right, yeah, if you, if you can transfer it, that'd be fine. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll talk to whoever and see what we can get set up. I'll put you back Thank in you. the queue. Morgan, if you could grab that and help him out with profit gauges. We will, uh, Brent should be coming in here any minute. You know what? I'm going to take this call and then Brent can join me uh, if we get him in here. Let's go to Virginia. James, welcome to the program. Good morning, Kevin. Thank you for accepting my call. Got a question about the CMC. This weekend I was uh, signing up to get the VIP pass and your seminar, and I want to, my girlfriend wants to, know what I do and how the business works. So I was going to bring her. Now, when I signed up, at the end, to show my credit card and my breakdown of the VIP pass, your seminar, and her as a family member, and her VIP pass, but it didn't show the CMC. Do I have to pay a separate, do I have to make out a whole separate one for her also? Yes, and and here's the reason why. Um, We only have a limited number of physical seats in that room. And we we can't expand it. So let's say that everybody who is coming wanted to bring their spouse. That would really cut Mm -hmm. us down from 200 businesses in the room to just 100. So so we we have to charge for every seat and we can't even really give a discount. I mean, our budget's really tight on this. So, yes, if she does want to attend the CMC, she can. We'd love to have her, but there there isn't any kind of a discount for the other person. Oh, no, no problem. I just wanted to make sure. So what I yeah. do is I make yep. up two tickets, and uh, we'll see you. And it is on the 20th, correct? Not the 21st. It starts on the 20th? Uh, Wednesday. I'm not looking at a calendar gotcha. right at the moment, so I don't want to screw it up. The, the truck show itself is Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. The CMC is Wednesday and Thursday morning. Wednesday all day, gotcha. plus a reception Wednesday night, and then half a day Thursday, and then you go right into the truck show. Well, Kevin, I will see you for my first CMC. It was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for the info. Looking forward to it. Really am. It's exciting to have the CMC going again. And I love the fact now that the CMC is going to go all year. You know, I was working on the material a little bit over the weekend. Uh, Not as much as I probably should have. Because the weather was kind of nice and I got out and got some garden therapy. I do have to say the garden here at the house, I've never, ever been this early. I spent all weekend. The weather was pretty decent. I got it all cleaned up. Everything's ready for planting. I, I've actually done planting already. Uh, I've got onions in. I've got bulbs in. Um, it's February. I don't think I've ever done that before. Uh, but I did get some work and thought done on the CMC material. And one of the things I realized that makes this much more powerful than just the five-day event 
like we've done in the past. The problem with the five-day event, there's just way too much material, and some of it we need time to absorb. So when I do these virtual classes over weeks or months, I'm able to actually, I know people freak out about this, but I'm able to give you homework. I'm able to say, look, here's a concept. I want you to go apply this to your numbers. Here's what you need to do. And then next week, we'll talk about that. And that's the way the CMC will happen now. We have all year. So I really have time to make sure you understand every concept before we move on to the next concept. All right. Uh, I am. Oh, there's Brent. I was going to say I'm not seeing Brent, but I see him in there. Brent, good morning. Mr. Rutherford, good morning. How are you, sir? I am doing wonderful. This is Brent Hutto from truckstop.com. It is uh, it's Monday. Boy, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're back into this Monday routine. You and I getting together and talking about the market. Oh, my gosh. I'm super excited. Every Monday, man, I, I get up. I get up in the morning, start doing my reading, look at all the data that's been happening happened the last seven days in the spot market, and, and I know I get to be on with uh, with Kevin Rutherford, the man, the legend, and so I get to talk about the marketplace. So I am too, Kevin. But, uh, my Mondays are more fun now. Yeah, and we're, I was just on a call with the CMC. Him and his uh, yeah. lovely bride will be joining us. I love that as well. So I'm, I'm really excited about the CMC. Fantastic. Hey, did Juan, did Juan sign up from, from uh, last week when we were talking to him about his business and he was trying to get going again? Did we know if Juan never signed up? Oh, you know what? I never followed up on that. I should go back and look. <laughs> well, I certainly hope he did. And if he's out there listening, Juan, if you're out there listening, certainly hope to see you in um, in Louisville, Kentucky in, uh, gosh, in less than a month. I know. So, uh, very excited about that. It's happening yeah. fast. So, it definitely is happening fast. I, uh, I got to spend last week uh, addressing the National Asphalt Association, uh, which <laughs> uses a lot of trucks. <laughs> That's not, it's, just, it's, a funny, it's just funny to say that. The National Asphalt Association. I know. I know. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a whole bunch of associations that make up a bigger group. And I got to address hey. them in Tampa. And, and you know, so they have the same questions everybody else does. Are, they, you know, are, are trucks going to be plentiful? And where do I find them? Yeah, good point. Hey, I know that's asphalt. Do you do anything with um, concrete? Yeah, you know, it's the same association. The, the Asphalt and uh, Association is really the Pavement Preservation Society, although that's an association that's kind of a bigger name. But that encompasses both asphalt and concrete. And isn't and there? So these groups these groups are, are together, yeah. Isn't there like some giant concrete show every year somewhere? I know one year it was in Orlando because I lived there at the time. Well, there's the, there's the world of concrete. That maybe which that's is, the one uh, I'm thinking which of. Which is usually, in, yeah, that's usually in Las Vegas. It takes over the entire Las Vegas convention yeah. centers. In other words, every square foot, every square foot uh, it, of it. And I think it. it and I'm, yeah, go ahead. Well, the first time I saw that, I'm like, "Come on, it's concrete. How much can there be to know? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's concrete. <laughs> obviously, 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 more than more than we realize. I know obviously a lot more than we realize. Yeah, yeah. So pretty uh, fascinating. Really, a, a fascinating, fascinating industry, you know. And uh, and and remember, concrete and cement are different. I had to figure. I I, I, I got to educate on that too. You know, same with me. I was talking about this one day, and somebody called me and said, "You know, you keep saying cement, and it's not cement." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" I use the two. I I used to. I try not to do it anymore. I used to use them interchangeably. I didn't realize there was a difference. Yeah. There definitely is. They get a little offended when you don't. uh, I know. Refer to it the right way. But yeah. uh, no, it was a lot of fun, and uh, uh, so much going, man. Their their concerns, and the, the obviously anything to do I, with the the grounds that truckers drive on is important. I, I got to I got to talk to them about my uh, the opportunity when I got to speak for in front of the Senate Transportation Committee about you know what's the what's the best thing government can do to help the trucking industry, and I said well, you can make sure that the roads and bridges are in good operating order because. Those are the things that put truckers out of business when they're not in good shape, uh, and uh, because of the maintenance issues that go on. And uh, so that, they, were, they were very curious about uh, about you know is where's the marketplace? You know when's that, when are things going to return? Of course, in the asphalt and concrete world, when it deals with the pavement, it um, they have a lot to do with obviously the government infrastructure bill for government you know uh, 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 in government programs for building all the roads and bridges, and so. 
it was a lot of fun to to talk with them, and they they had the same you know the same questions a lot of people ask, which is when's the market going to pivot, and when's it going to pivot back to a more beneficial market for carriers. You know, it's interesting, and we've talked about this a lot. We have the numbers mm-hmm. that, that we're going to talk about now, the averages, what we're seeing in the market. But yet we still seem yeah. to have a lot of, of – I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about the small side of the market because that's where I deal with owner-operators and yeah. small fleets – that still seem to be kind of defying the odds. Their numbers are significantly better than what you would think they would be right now. I just had a caller who just went over all of his numbers for last year. All miles. Mm -hmm. Now, this this is, you know, we're tracking deadhead miles. We're tracking empty miles. We're tracking miles back and forth to the shop, whatever it might be. That's the way we track mileage and profit gauges. So that means that this number isn't the freight rate he's getting. He has to get a significantly higher rate than this to average down to this number for all miles, 242 a mile. That's impressive. Okay. Yeah, that's for all miles, you said. All miles. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's interesting. Do you, know you know what the five-year average in the spot market for all freight is? What's that? Uh, $2.42. Wow. Well, I that's pretty looked, crazy. I, I just looked it up. You know, we, we, tr- yeah, we trend everything. And so I always look at, you know, when you and I are talking and I'm ever addressing on our operators, I always say, look at the five-year average on something. You kind of want to know where the marketplace is because that takes in – to consideration, usually an up cycle and a down cycle, and and considering we're in the we're in the bottom of a down cycle right now, I always pull a five year averages, and the, this past week it was two dollars and forty two cents. Well, uh, which is it, which is obviously that su- super unique. Yeah, that is, and uh, you know that that is, a, in my opinion, a very strong rate for owner operators and small carriers. Because of all the accounting we do with profit gauges, we know that the, mm-hmm. the goal to shoot for, let me make sure I explain this number right. The goal that we shoot for is the first thing we do is we take equipment payments out of the equation. And the reason we do that is we want to look at operational numbers every day. And and two people can walk into a dealer and buy the same truck, but buy it very differently. One puts all cash down, the other one puts zero cash down. Mm -hmm. So those equipment payments can really get confusing in your accounting. So you know data and numbers there's all kinds of different ways of looking at it and and the more you understand this the Mm -hmm. the more powerful the data becomes but if we pull equipment payments out because those are confusing now all of us have to go buy fuel we have to pay for maintenance we you know we have all those expenses that are very similar so now we can compare this um our goal for a single truck owner operator driving the truck is that you should be able to keep 50% 50% of what you gross. Now, that's without equipment payments. And if you can get there, that that's a really good, strong number. So now if we apply that right. to this average rate, 242 a mile, I, I get to keep $1.21 a mile. If I can get my operational cost to 50%, a $1.21 a mile, that goes into my pocket. That's a big right. deal. That's- yeah, and you, you're doing that without well without the equipment payment. You're Correct, saying. right? So, so, so the so the goal is to run an operation with your truck paid off. That's always the goal, yes. But even if you yeah, don't yeah. have it paid off and you have an equipment payment, in order to see how efficient we're operating, we want to set that equipment payment aside because it doesn't really show us efficiency. Yeah. Right, right, because it, it is it, it, it's a it's a, it's a it's a, a fixed cost, cost, right? Of, yeah. Cost for your pay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Fixed cost. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Fixed cost across the board. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. The idea of buying your truck really well. You yeah. Know? yeah. Uh, and so I think I, I, I think I can remember you back during uh, the, the Overdrive Partners in Business Day saying to owner operators over and over and over, don't ever buy a new truck. Uh, it, and, until you can pay cash for it. Don't buy a new truck. Yeah, and, and you know, that's not a hard and fast rule. I have financed right. new trucks over time, and it really depends what the what is the rate doing. You know, certainly when we can pay cash, that keeps our cost as low as possible. And it, that was one of those statements we tried to drill into people's heads so that if you decide you do want to go buy a new truck, and I'm not saying you, you should right, never. Right. In fact, in today's world, I, I'm, I'm much more likely to recommend it 
to the right people because the new equipment is really impressive. Finally, you know, after a decade of, oh, wow. of being afraid of new trucks with emission problems and all that other stuff, we're past that. Right. Right. I have no problem right. now buying new equipment if you can afford it. For sure. Yeah. But we're, you know, we're looking at, you know, we could build a new truck today that I hate to use the word guarantee, but we could be pretty darn positive if you spec it right, we could be looking at nine plus miles to the gallon. Well, yeah, and that that's meaningful, obviously, uh, when you're talking about <laughs> your biggest expense is fuel. Yeah. Uh, you know, operational expense is fuel. So, um you know, every every additional mile. I used to I used to hear, and I think you said this: is every additional mile about ten thousand dollars in it, their pocket, just gross you, money? You, you do remember the the metric correctly, and it it obviously depends on <laughs> fuel price. When fuel price is in that right. four dollar a gallon range, which is you know where we've been right. bouncing around for a while then yes every one mile per gallon you can increase fuel economy usually puts almost ten thousand dollars back in your pocket wow i mean that's meaningful so when my when our friend uh henry albert is, who where everybody else is running six six and a half he's running ten he's averaging 10 miles per gallon he's obviously putting a lot of uh, a lot of bucks back in his pocket yeah yeah yeah, Henry's uh, Henry's a regular yeah. co-host on our Friday show now. So our Friday show oh, is all really? oh great idea. Yeah, so our yeah. Friday show now is all about efficiency, primarily fuel economy, but oh, we talk about yeah. maintenance and yeah. So actually, there there are four of us that do the Friday show now. So it's uh, myself, oh, well, um, yeah, Henry Albert, who you just mentioned, and uh-huh. you know, let, let's uh-huh. tie this all together. You, you and I have talked about when when you and I met, it was at the Mid-America Truck Show, which we're coming up on again now. Yeah. It was my first ever seminar, Partners in Business, and it, the year was mm-hmm. 1999. That was also the year I met right. Henry Albert, and I think that was the year he was owner operator of the year for Overdrive, wasn't he? Yeah, uh, 99. Let me see. No, I think I'll tell you real quick because I keep it in my uh, in my contacts. Give me one second. I'll, I'll tell you real quick. Let's see. Mr. Henry Albert, uh, let's see. He was 2007. Really? Uh, owner operator of the year. Boy, I thought yeah, I met yeah, him yeah, earlier yeah. than that. I met him the year that he won it, but yeah. boy, I thought it was way earlier than that that I met Henry. Well, uh, huh. yeah, I, I got to spend lots of time. I used to. Yeah. I still used to spend lots of time with the owner operator of the year because they were there were such. I used to. I would take them and I would. You know, I was back when when I was the salesperson for for Overdrive. And my customers were ExxonMobil and Michelin and Mac and Volvo and International. And I would take these owner operators a year around to talk to all the marketing people at those brands because I'd say, okay, you want to understand this market? Talk to this person. They're a great representative of not just the market or a truck driver. They're, they're a representation of the business approach to the market because these guys not only know how to drive a truck well, they know how to make money well yes. in this industry. Yep. Yeah, so the yeah. Friday shows. So who else is on the Who else is on the program? Yeah, yeah. So uh, are you familiar with Joel Morrow? Uh, I know the name. Yeah, so uh, very another interesting story going way back. So I, I go all the way back to mm-hmm. I, I was working on fuel economy ideas in the late 80s. Now, fuel was about 80 cents a gallon back then. And everybody thought I was insane. <laughs> a little lower. Yeah. Why, why do you even right. bother with that stuff? Who cares? It, that, that's all I ever heard. But it, it was right. it was still your biggest cost as an owner-operator. It might have only been 80 cents oh, a gallon. Sure. But that business is business. You focus on your biggest cost. That's where you have the most control. So right. I was doing that. Everybody thought yeah. I was insane. I didn't know anybody else that was doing it. Well, it turns out... Joel got into the industry right about the same time I did, or about the same year in the 80s. Uh And Joel was doing the exact same thing, and we were only about two hours away from each other. We were both in Northeast Ohio, but I never met him. Had no Mm -hmm. idea he was out there until just a couple years ago. And I ran into him um, on the, the Facebook group that we started for Fuel Mileage. And I, I, I was watching what this guy's doing. I'm like... I don't want to sound arrogant, but there was a time where I might have made the statement, I know more about heavy truck fuel mileage than anybody else in the country. I may have made that statement. 
and and it was <laughs> big picture. Like you, yeah. you know, I didn't know more about aerodynamics than an aerodynamic engineer did. I didn't know more about tire rolling right. resistance than, you know, an engineer might. But overall, all the things that could possibly affect fuel economy in a big truck, I didn't think there was mm-hmm. anybody else in mm-hmm. the country that knew as much as I did. As arrogant as that sounds, because I, I had never come across them. And I would think now there was right. the um, the one guy I met. And actually, I met him at Matt's, too. Uh, he's the guy that actually built the the Shell super truck. He's oh, been okay. He's yeah, been around I, forever. I the guy built yet. a cab over back in the 70s that was getting seven miles to the gallon. So I mm-hmm. that guy knows mm-hmm. a lot about fuel economy, but he's a little well, he's. Yeah. he's He's almost like a recluse. I mean, the guy's kind of difficult to work with. I think he's one of those people that's so intelligent, he's hard to relate to. So he, right. he never had a lot of visibility in the industry, even though he was doing some pretty incredible things. Um, but then I, I ran into Joel a couple of years ago, and I thought, this guy, first off, 90% of everything I thought I knew about fuel economy, he agreed with. I mean, it's physics. Okay. It is what it is. It, it, this, it, it stuff either works or it doesn't. But then he had mm-hmm. an area that I, it was probably my weakest area of fuel economy. And it's the, the architecture of the engine itself, how that engine is oh, yeah, built, sure. the, the, the yeah, stroke, yeah. the bore, the rod length, the, the journal overlap. I mean, there's all these factors and he really understood that at a level that, that I've never seen from anybody else. And wow. now I've now learned okay. that from him. Okay. Joel actually starts. So Joel's a, a, has been an owner operator, small fleet owner. He also comes from uh, a family fleet in uh, Northeast Ohio, Ploger Transportation. You familiar with them? Hmm. Clover? Ploger. Ploger. P L O. Oh, P L O. O-U-G-H-E-R? Yeah, I think they're in Norwalk, maybe. Norwalk, Ohio. Okay. They're up in that area yeah. somewhere. Uh, uh, family I'll run. I'll look them up. Yeah. Really, really very, very well-run small fleet. They do a lot of furniture stuff. Uh, so Joel's got a huge mm-hmm. background uh, in all of this. So Joel also started a company called Alpha Drivers, and it's, it's fuel mileage consulting. Um, Joel works okay. directly with the engineers at Volvo, like over in Sweden. He goes oh. over to Sweden and oh, okay. spends yeah. time over there and goes through their European trucks and he gets to drive on their test tracks. And he's actually been responsible mm-hmm. for changes to the engine and the truck. Wow. Yeah. So, and his partner, Alec, which is also another one of those guys that chased fuel economy for years. Uh, it's the four of us that do okay. the show. So Joel and Alec, Henry and I, uh, and it, it's really becoming my favorite day. I mean, the four of us can just really geek out on this stuff. Wow. Yeah. Well, sound, well I know how you like to get. Well, it, it, <laughs> it's funny you're talking about it. You said it, it, it's become your favorite day. I'm not surprised. I mean, you love to look in the, at the numbers. Yeah. You love to yeah. look at the specifics of things because, it's, you know, the, as they say, it's not, it's, not, it's not always the big picture. It's paying attention to the small picture because the small picture makes up the big picture. And so if you'll pay attention to all the little pieces, even even what you were talking about, about engine specs, all the way down to the bore of the engine and how you're trying to make efficiency. Look, and I, and I understand a little bit of sort of the lore around wanting to have the coolest, biggest, baddest engine out there. But in the end, the one that's, the, that's getting you back as much money as possible is probably the one you're going to love the most. So, yeah, I'm not surprised that you love that. You know what else is interesting about this? So you're right. We People who like trucks, we tend to be gear heads. We like horsepower and torque, and mm-hmm. it, we talk about all that stuff. The interesting thing is if you take mm-hmm. today's engines that are available and you look at mm-hmm. what we tend to think of as like the premium owner-operator mm-hmm. models, primarily that would mm-hmm. be Packard, Kenworth, and Peterbilt. Have been the yeah, well, they're like, the one that's most loved. Yeah, yeah, right. they're sure. they're like the mm-hmm. American owner operator. You know that that these aren't they don't build fleet specs. They that that's always been. And then there was a time where cat engines. You know, if you had a Peterbilt and a cat engine, mm-hmm. that was all you. Needed. I remember those days. Yeah, yeah 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, the interesting thing now is if you look at pack car and the engines it has available, its own engine, the pack car engine or the Cummins, um, they look, always look like they have a higher horsepower rating. And that's why gearheads like them. The problem is when you right. understand engine architecture, you're not able to access that horsepower and torque on the road. It's in the wrong RPM range. Oh, really? Hmm. So, yes, you can say oh, I well, have I 560 yeah. horsepower, but you almost never access it. So mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. The, the Volvo engine and the Mac, because they're virtually identical, their horsepower rating and torque rating isn't quite as high but in the real world, on any given day, those two trucks pulling the hill, the Volvo is going to beat it because it's accessing right. all of its oh. horsepower and torque in an RPM range that, that we can do on the road. That, that's the difference. And this right. area can get really deep and complicated. And, um, you know, sometimes you can kidding. really get into the weeds on this. But it, it, and it took me a while. Like I said, this was something I didn't understand until I started working with Joel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's wow. a, it's a yeah, it's a big deal. Good. I mean, Joel has now yeah, <laughs> um, in the real world moving freight, so he's got his own authority. He's, he's uh, he runs right. He's actually yeah. got a team driver, yeah. so they put a lot of miles on the truck. But he documents everything, yeah. and he posts it all so everybody yeah. can see. He has had thirty day averages over eleven. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, that's super impressive, Kevin. Uh, I'm looking at this here. He's got 4 million plus miles. He's been doing this for almost 37 years. And you're right. He's out of Norwalk, Ohio. And uh, so he's got a lot of great stuff on his uh, on his uh, LinkedIn page. And uh, so I look yeah. forward to uh, spending some time talking to Joel. What a, what a great, I mean, this is a great guy you can tap into. And this is, this is another reason, KR, that, that, you know, people should, more people should listen to the Let's Try, you know, program because you're really bringing in information that, is not just from engineers. It, look, engineers at truck manufacturers and other people are great. They're fantastic. But you're talking about real world with Joel and Henry both going not just not just getting to 10 miles a gallon, but getting past that. Yes. And that's just unheard of. Yeah, that's just unheard of. So what a great program. i got to listen to the program, man. I, so that, that ought to be a lot of fun. You you know, we and we go beyond that. We, we talk a lot about, the really right. in-depth stuff, um, working with brokers and building relationships. One of the things that Joel talks about, he talked about it again on Friday. Um, you know, this idea of, okay, you go get your own authority and, you know, why would you go work with these mega carriers or the mega brokers like C.H. Robbins? You know how everybody complains about it. The bigger a company gets, the bigger the target they become. Um, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Joel is just really good at running a business. He does all the things we talk about. And he found Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that one of the ways to really improve his overall business, he built a really strong relationship with Schneider's um, power only division, their brokerage. Oh, yeah. And Uh, it's been incredible for him. He he built some relationships with some agents within the within the walls. And he said it was it was unbelievable what that did as far as being able to fill in freight and really improve all of his numbers. So we we focus on, you know, fuel mileage and maintenance cost, but we really cover the whole operation on Friday. It's one of those days we kind of really get down deep into some of the details. Right. So you were talking about power only, you said? Yeah. So the reason I asked is because I was just at, I was at this conference, as I mentioned to you, up to this conference uh, two weeks ago, where I heard uh, three of the largest players in the entire marketplace talk about how they were investing in power only freight a, yep. because the shipper is asking for more and more of power only freight because of the flexibility it gives them on being able to load the trailers. Yes. So a really, really big deal. So, so talk, tell me a little bit more about that because that, that's fascinating. That's an opportunity. Yeah. So, well, let's talk about flexibility for a small carrier. Uh, I've talked in the past that right. there's really no reason why as a small carrier, even one truck, you shouldn't at least consider owning multiple kinds of trailers because trailers oh, are fairly yeah, inexpensive. Should. They last a long time. They don't really cost us a mm-hmm. lot of money to own and maintain a trailer. It doesn't cost much. And it gives us all kinds of flexibility, mm-hmm. seasonally or whatever. If flatbed freight is booming, hey, grab your flatbed and go move some mm-hmm. freight. When, when reefers kicked in, go do that. 
So that that's one way to increase your revenue and be more flexible. And then we right. can add this like third leg to this. Now you could also go out there and, and work on some of this power only freight. Now, this doesn't matter what kind of trailer you have anymore. You're not, you don't need a trailer. Power only means exactly that. You show up with a truck and there's work to be done. Sometimes right. it's moving new trailers out to deliveries. Many times mm-hmm. it's moving a loaded trailer, mm-hmm. though, or it's repositioning mm-hmm. equipment, or uh, it's just it's one more tool that, um, that really gives you a lot of flexibility and increases revenue possibilities. And that this power well, only thing is it. becoming yeah. really yeah. A, a big deal. I'm not surprised that you're hearing about it from the other end of the market. Well, think about this. Think about if you're a, a lease owner operator thinking about making the jump to being independent, um, and you've been hauling freight for a large fleet and doing well with it, and, and you know it was a, it's a great it was a great opportunity for you to get take your business and move it from you know the first sort of smaller step to becoming completely independent. That you know, but you don't have your own trailer because you've been hauling for a large fleet for a while because they right. have their own trailers, and and so it's an easy way for you to jump into the marketplace without having to make that first big you know sort of external purchase of a trailer, and trailers can be you know they they're not inexpensive but they're not super expensive but they're not inexpensive but you can actually jump into the power only part and start hauling freight immediately uh, and. And and then and then ease into buying a trailer when when you're ready to, to you know to make it make financial sense. Yeah. But to me, I love it. But I, I heard I heard, and I'm talking about the largest the largest carrier in America was talking about how they're investing into it. And then the I think the fifth largest carrier in America was talking about how they're they're like really looking at that for, for growth in their business in the next two three years. Yep. That that is and like I said, we're we're promoting it down on the our end of the market. That this now that this model of power only is growing and it's more available, this is a real advantage for small carriers. Oh, well, for sure it is. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what's driving a lot of this is the Amazon effect, and that's that's really something that I learned when I was there. Is the, the Amazon effect of having a need to position that freight faster uh, to other locations, and so um, and what I mean by the Amazon effect is that you know. All goods have to get to more geographically centered areas around larger cities uh, because more and more people are ordering things that need to be delivered within one day or, or even that day uh, to a customer. So the, all these big, big warehouses are, you know, are beginning to be built and then filled with freight that needs to get to or deliveries that need to be delivered, mostly by, by parcel, but it's got to get there eventually. So all of this, this, this need for the product, and it's not just Amazon. I mean, Target's doing this, Walmart's doing this. All the big players are doing this where they're getting their goods closer to the customer. But in order to do it, you got to have a lot more truck movement. Yeah. So this power only is a big deal. Yeah, So because it's repositioning the freight. Yeah, and and you know it creates a, a lot of opportunities down on on our side of the market, and that's uh, one of the things oh, Joel's been taking advantage of. Yeah, huge opportunities, and so that's one reason why you and I do this program. This is, 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 is why I'm the one reason why I'm on this program is to talk about new opportunities in the market where the small player, the owner operator, the five truck, the, the ten truck person can have the access to the data and the information to be able to operate or compete with larger carriers. You know, and so that's that's the whole goal. The whole goal is to make sure that that, that opportunity is talked about where the listener can say, oh, well, maybe I need to dive more into that. Exactly. Exactly. Good stuff. There's, you know, there, there, there are a lot of positive trends we're seeing in the, the marketplace for small carriers. You know, there, there's this there's this thought that goes around all the time that, you know, the big megas are all trying to put owner operators out of business. And I've been hearing this for three decades. And every time I hear this, it turns out to be the opposite. And this again is another example of that. (laughs) I'm watching what's happening in the marketplace right now and thinking, I can't think Mm -hmm. of a better time to be a small carrier. Well, I agree with you. Yeah, it's, it, it is the opposite. These large carriers don't want the small carriers to go out of the marketplace because they carry the freight. Here's, and this is what most people don't, don't understand. They carry the freight that the big carriers don't really want to want to want to haul because they can't. It doesn't work in their system. They can't. Right. When you when you move, right. if, if you move, if, if you move, if you can make money moving one of something, and you, your ability to move that is much different than somebody who. Can, that, that can make money when they move ten thousand 
of something. In other words, if somebody has 10,000 movements and it's in five lanes and you've got 5,000 trucks, you can maximize the network effect on that. But if you've only got two or three you know, freight, full truckloads of freight to move, a big carrier would go, I don't really know how to deal with that. Right. And that's why these big right. carriers, honestly, Kevin, this is why these big carriers have invested into their brokerage so the brokerage can have access to the small carriers. <laughs> that's you know, right. Predominantly the owner operators. <laughs> yep. I mean, they're all doing it because they're like, oh, well, there's this great network out there joined on the load boards and I can get access to them. Heck yeah, I'm going to build a brokerage. Yeah. So, hey, this one player I was talking to that's out of, uh, let's just say it's out of the Midwest in the Nebraska area, said, said that, that, that he said that I, he goes, I'm, I'm downplaying a lot of what I'm doing with all my, 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 my big massive trucks. And I'm up, I'm up playing, or I'm improving my brokerage company. He goes, I've, we've gone from a hundred million dollar brokerage to a billion dollar brokerage in less than 10 years. Wow. And it's because they have access to small carriers. That's, so, and this is why, this is why they don't want the owner operator to go away. They want more access to the owner operator because it, it, in the end, they're there to do the same thing as small guys. They want to make a profit. They just need to make a profit. And they'll, they want to do it any way they can. You know, I, I've talked about this concept over the years and, I've talked about it on the air. I've talked about it in, you know, speaking engagements when I go speak in other places. I, most of the time that I talk about this, I never get the reaction I think I'm going to get. kind of tend to get the deer in the headlights okay. look, and I must not be explaining it right. But here's, right. here's what I truly believe, that if we look at the big picture of freight movement, let's look at the big picture because mm -hmm. that's the industry we're in. We're mo we move stuff from one place to another. Pretty simple, really. Right. What is the most efficient way to get that freight moved from point A to point B? And what I mean by most efficient is how do we move it in a way that the people responsible for moving it make the maximum amount of profit? Th th to me, that's okay. what business is all about. So what, what is that, what does that model look like? If we wanted to move freight from point A to point B at the lowest possible cost so that we generate the maximum amount of profit. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm tracking. My belief is that when you take a really good small broker who understands customer service and, and all those things that, that make you a good mm -hmm. small broker, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you match right. that to a single truck owner operator with his own authority, I do not believe there's okay. any more profitable or efficient way to move freight than that combination right there. Well, it seems like you're doing what you do best which is the broker is really good at the negotiation and organization of the actual making, you know, acquiring the freight to make available to be moved on a truck. And then the trucker, the, the small, the small business owner is the absolute best at the efficiency of taking that freight from point A to point B. So you're both doing what you're inherently very good at. Yep. And so it would seem like your cost, your cost to do it, would be the lowest opportunity cost um, to be able to do it. Now, if we think about that, as an industry, shouldn't that be our goal to move towards that model? <laughs> we It's good for the economy. I would hope so. We, we yeah. talk all the time yeah. about we are so important because every piece of the economy has to go through us. I get that. I would have that. Mm -hmm. Well, then mm -hmm. the more efficient we are, the better it is for the entire country. It's better for inflation, but we can also profit more at the same time. What we're trying to do is eliminate waste. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Eliminate waste because we can keep cost as low as possible to the end customer and the consumer, and we can still generate more mm -hmm. profit. You're never going to find mm -hmm. a company driver. I, I, the, and this isn't a criticism of them. It's just the reality. You're never going to find a company driver that works as hard as Joel or Henry or Alec or the people we talk about to get 10, 11, 12 miles to the gallon. Why would they bother? Mm -hmm. So instead, we have an industry average fuel economy of 6.6 .6 miles to the gallon. So here's what we're doing because we're so inefficient with fuel in this industry. The only people that benefit from this are the oil companies. <laughs> True. Right? <laughs> We're giving the oil right. companies way more money than we should. They profit. They don't mind this at all. They love this. They love seeing trucks get no. six miles to the gallon. That's pure profit for them. Now, 
you take some of these guys that are now getting close to 12. We're almost doubling that. Now, the the only thing we did was take Amazing. profit away from the oil company and put it back in the trucking industry where it belongs. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. You would think you would think more people would be focused on that. So who who could possibly be more efficient driving down the road than a guy who has all the skin in the game and he owns the truck and the profit that he generates is his? Nobody's going to touch that. Well, guy. nobody. Yeah. Right. Nobody. Nobody's going to touch. It. Right. You know, the, the yeah. number that Atri put out recently, I think, was that um, it, it costs like two dollars and twenty eight cents a mile to run a truck today. Now, that includes driver wages. <laughs> well, well, but yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> when I saw that number, I thought, you have got to be kidding me. I have owner operators that operate for less than a dollar a mile. Right. Sure. That's not even close. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that's why I'm so excited yeah, well, about the, mean, uh, you know, yeah. what we do. I'm excited about the CMC. I mean, I, I'm for the first mm-hmm. time in, in the entire time I've been in this industry, and you know this, I, I have never really put any big push on, on making owner operators into carriers. But that's what we're doing now because I think the timing is right. Right. Well, I think the timing's right. And you just look at the ability to access what is important to running your operation, which is the information on available freight in the marketplace, rates in the marketplace, um, negotiation strength in where you're, you know, from where, where you are and where you're going to, uh, available ability technology that allows you to book, um, multiple pieces of freight within, you know, whatever time frame you want to haul, three days, seven days, 14 days, whatever. You know, there, you've just got access to data to be able to, 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 for you to be able to run your operation. And that's the key. The key is, do you, do you have access to that information? And, uh, and, and to, in today's world, for the owner operator, they do. And this is what, this is, this is why the owner operator has more opportunity to sustain their business and grow their business today than ever. And you're right. Yep. Now's the, now's a great time to do it. Yep. And, and it's a down market, which means if you're, if you, if you construct your business, with efficiency in mind, in a down market, no matter what happens in the market, as it moves back and forth, if it goes up, you're only going to make more money because That's your it. efficiency is so good when when you've got a, when you've got a marginal rate up there. So yeah, and um, so I agree with you, Kevin. I, that to now is, is, is a great time to get in the market. Now you got to be wise. You, know, you got to be wise. Fo- follow the rules, if you know what I'm saying. But uh, now's a great time. Yeah, do Do we know somewhere where you could go to maybe learn all of these rules about how to be successful? Well, you know, Kevin, it, if it was just a place like maybe Louisville, Kentucky, yeah, the day before the Mid America Truck Show, yes, that, that at would the, be perfect. At the CNC, <laughs> put out by let. You know, if it was just an opportunity on the Wednesday before Mid America started, and maybe it was an all day event, and it, and it only cost you a uh, very little amount of money to sign up and come to, and it not only did it happen then, but it actually was a program you could sign up for that at a, at a very cost-effective rate that you could be helping to run the efficiency with your business a year long. Uh, wow. If it was just a place like yeah. that at Louisville, Kentucky the day before, well, it would be great. <laughs> we, we should work on <laughs> something. Great. We should work on something. <laughs> well, you know, Kevin, I, I don't know if you know this, but we have been working on this. <laughs> yeah, they, the CNC, I'm excited, that's why I'm so excited, Kevin, because the, the ability to, to be able to deliver this to a marketplace face to face. We're partnered with the Mid America Truck Show. Toby Young and his crew there helping us bring this to the market. Us uh, Truck Stop partnering with Let's Truck and bringing the 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 excellent uh, data and information to helping guys get into the disguise and girls get into the business, run a good business, and and most importantly, and and the reason why you do this and we do this is so they can enjoy being and doing what they love to do, which is to drive a truck every day. Yep. And make money doing it. Yeah. All right. Hey, yeah, I, I've man. got. So the mar- the, mar- the Yeah. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Oh, no. The marketplace. I don't know if you want to talk about what's going on in the market. From <laughs> that, the that, I was just going to say. I, I'm talk about. Yeah, I have one more topic, kind of an oddball topic I want to talk yeah, about because you and I have fun let's with that. It. But let's do the let's rates do first. Let's do that. And then we'll finish with the odd yeah. topic. Well, good, well, yeah, fantastic. Uh, so right now, uh, the marketplace still has about 10 to 15 percent more freight in it the spot market does than it normally does over a five-year period. So there's still freight in the marketplace in all segments and in, in band, flatbed, reefer, specialized, the oversized, overdimensional. There's freight across the board. So 
And I realize it's not priced where it was a couple, a couple years ago during the pandemic, but there's still freight out there that you can negotiate well on. And that's super important to think about, Kevin, because it, that's what drives the rate. And so rates are, 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 they went up from last week to this week, they actually went up two cents. And over the last four weeks, they're up about three cents. And I think that's, that's, and I know this is mostly being driven because fuel actually went up, the fuel surcharge went up too. So it went right. up from 48 cents to 52 cents. So it went up four cents over the last few weeks. And, uh, which so that, that tells you why the, the actual overall rate's going up. So it's been kind of stable around 230. 235 coming. That's 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 all freight. You know, van van is still at a dollar ninety this past week. Uh, flatbed was at 243 and Reaper was at 221. Reaper has taken a pretty large dive since the beginning of the year, from two dollars and forty eight cents down to two dollars and twenty one cents. But all in all, there's, there's 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 definitely freight to be to be moved in the marketplace. So and I know that because I look at the pressure out there, the market demand index. It it the 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 Normal in the market's up 50, and right now it's at 60, which means there's that means there's more freight being looked at in, within the market, and so that's good to know that 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 the more that the freight's being looked at, usually it's starting to drive up prices higher. But I, I will say this: overall, there's not much indication that it's going to change a lot right now. So right now, just you need to set your marks, as you've always said, you just need to set your marks on. All right, how do I need to be as efficient as possible? What can I control? What costs? Can I control? Am I buying fuel for right? Am I negotiating the right load in the right lane in that area of the country? I know if you if you like to look in the southeast and south if, if the southeast was down, you, know, you need to look in the Midwest. Maybe the rates are higher in the Midwest. And uh, so so the idea is to, is to really understand when you're looking at at, at the, the the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pieces of data that will, that are in a marketplace for the spot, spot market to know where where to look. I mean, that's super important. I can tell you that uh, right now, the the mountain central region was up 6.8% in load availability. That was the biggest gainer in load availability. And on, on rates, uh, the mountain central was down 1%. You know, they, a, a lot of this, these are aggregate numbers, and the southeast was up almost 2%. So looking at the data, look at the data, look at the data every single week for you to be able to understand what marketplace is. And that, that one or two or three percent makes a big difference, you know, when you're moving freight. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, good stuff. All right. On to the, uh, the oddball you topic. You had one more topic. I did. Um, the oddball topic, all right. All Friday's right. AT&T outage. Oh, my goodness. Oh, golly. <laughs> Uh, it, that was a crazy day. You know, it was, and, and it's it's not that I didn't know this, but it's, you know, sometimes we don't think about things enough. How important that data communication, whether it's, it's cellular or whatever, how important that has become to mm-hmm. the movement of freight, to us in trucking? Well, it's everything. I mean, if you if your mode of communi- main mode of communication is shut down, <laughs> where does that get you? Yeah, I, you know, we have to understand that that trucking is kind of a unique business, and when we look at most businesses, the the bulk mm-hmm. of their work is is in one physical location. Like you own a store, or a restaurant, or a warehouse, or a manufacturing facility. It's right. in one place, and all of your employees are there, and you can look at them all day long. I mean, that's very different from running a business where you don't sometimes ever see your employees. And they're, they're out all over the country, scattered all over the place. Communication is pretty important. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, but without a doubt. I mean, how, how do you – you can't – I mean, <laughs> we have a mobile industry that needs to have – mobile access to its communication yeah and if it gets shut down what 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 could be your default that and and i hope very difficult very difficult situation that we start thinking about that and putting some backup plans in place now i still haven't heard a good explanation of why it went out at&t came out all they did was apologize and say we'll try to do better but they didn't tell us what happened what caused this now there was also two big solar flares that day. So right. a lot of some people said, oh, the solar flare caused it. It's not impossible, but it's a little odd that it only really hit AT&T. It was a solar yeah. flare. It should have affected all carriers at least somewhat equally. But I talked to people who the husband had an AT&T phone and the wife had an AT&T phone and they're standing next to each other. One of them's working and one of them wasn't. Right. 
How do you explain that? Yeah, I think it was. Well, I, it's fun, it's interesting. I, I've got my, some of the guys up that I went to, to the college with are involved in the, the, the tech world, and uh, they were talking about that uh, there was a, a push of a, uh, of a of an update to their system, and it had and it went system wide, and it didn't. You know, in technology, most of the time it works really perfectly, and you never see a blip. And this one, this this upgrade to their to their system. Not to your the operating system of your phone, but to the actual network system, uh, it didn't go well, and their default didn't work well either, and so uh, that's why we had the outage. So it just it's just that uh, you know sometimes things happen, and when they do, boy, is it difficult. That sounds more likely to me since it was primarily focused around mm-hmm. AT&T, although early on there were reports of almost every carrier having outages. It was almost like it could have been some interference from the solar flares and just a coincidence that AT&T pushed out a big update and it bombed. Um, But the point is, we got a little bit of a taste of what could happen in trucking if we lose communication. And one of the things I try to tell drivers is, you know, what are you going to do if you're 2,000 miles away from home and your cell phone doesn't work? There really aren't pay phones oh, on every right. corner. There yeah. isn't a bank of 32 pay phones at every truck stop the way there used to be. Uh, do you have a way right. to communicate? Do you have a way? To, so I, I and the other thing, one of the reasons I'm talking about this today is there, there were really two big solar flares. They could have been responsible for stuff like this disrupted oh, communication could have, pro- could have been exacerbated the problem yeah right mm-hmm. but the sun just released the biggest of all so far just released another or there's a solar a sunspot building that could potentially be the biggest of all if if it turns into a solar flare there just seems to be an awful lot of solar activity lately i actually have an app that tracks this well yeah i, I don't I don't. Uh, I don't really dig much into that. But I'll tell you, when you were talking about people's phones, uh, different systems being affected, yeah, you know, most people don't realize that that all of the mobile phone industry is connected to each other because they all work off of different. Each they 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 and sometimes they share satellite. Right. Most of the time they share the actual physical um, uh, pole that's on the ground. The you've got a, a, one. You know, a, lot, a lot of those. A lot of those. Cell towers are actually independently owned by groups of people, investors, and they allow AT and T and Verizon right. and, and anyone else that, that, to be able to T-Mobile to be able to pack into that pole to be able to use it. And so that so they're they're they're, they're like stepping over everybody's system. So you know what happens to one is usually going to happen to another within this marketplace because they're all connected. It's like the internet. It's the same, yeah. same, same application of the internet. Yeah. So just something uh, I've been paying attention to because that that solar activity could be an issue and it it could be a big issue for us in this industry and like i said drivers being away from home now not really the same topic but kind of i saw a really interesting post by elon this morning i'm trying to figure out (laughs) how or what or and he's good at this he just puts up these weird little posts and you think right what was that all about i want i'm I'm gonna go back and look and see if i can find it so i can get the uh the actual wording on this because I I, okay. I don't know how all right here here's his post and this was just made 10 hours ago it says okay. this post was made from a normal mobile phone straight to a SpaceX satellite with no special equipment in between how is that possible? What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So, well, <laughs> here's what it means. Like, I, I could claim that the post I just put up on Twitter went through a Starlink satellite, too, because I've got a Starlink dish that I'm connected to, and it beams everything up to the right. satellite, and that's how I connect to the Internet. But what he's talking about is he communicated with that Starlink satellite with just a phone, no other equipment. How? That's oh. a big deal. Uh, I don't know that one. <laughs> that's a big deal. I don't know that. That sounds like uh, he he's he's giving you a little. Uh, hey, come and see what, yeah. what you know the different Tesla or whoever else, what other you know what other company he's invested into is 
is kind of developing. Uh, I do like his independence. Uh, I always appreciate Elon, Elon Musk's independence, and and uh, so so that's that's I don't know. I guess I guess we'll have to wait and see. Earlier, I saw an announcement by Starlink that by the end of this year, they were going to have a device that would fit in a backpack and would actually be Internet anywhere in the world. So I assumed a very, very wow. small satellite receiver, you know, small enough you could put it mm-hmm. in a bag or a backpack. Mm-hmm. But now he's making mm-hmm. this claim that he communicated directly with one of his satellites from a phone and no special equipment. Well, yeah. I'm going to have to go do some research on that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I'll tell you what, it is interesting. And uh, the, let me ask you a question about this. Uh, sure. I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I saw something very interesting, and this is maybe another, this is a related topic, something you and I have talked about many times, but it's the first time I've, I've heard uh, it from the other end. So with, and I'm, I'm going to bring up AV5, the independent contractor thing, which Elon Musk is commenting on that as well. So, yes. Yeah, but AV5 is, um, I was uh, talking to a broker the other day, and they were talking about how AV5 how is affecting them. And so they're having to bifurcate their business and put um, their brokerage division in one part of the business, their trucking division in another part of the business, and anybody that's a 1099 contractor in a separate part of their in, in another part of their business because they're trying to hedge the bet on how many other states will adopt AV5 type, you know, independent contractor laws uh, going forward, and they're just preparing for how all that's going to roll out. So I've, I've, I mean, I've, heard, I've heard it from carriers. I've heard certainly, you know, the, the attack on owner operators and independent contractors, but I've never heard a broker say, no, I've got to figure out my business too because it's going to affect me in a pretty dramatic way. Well, I, I'm sure there are a lot of brokerages that, that use agents that aren't necessary employees. Oh, tremendous amount. I mean, it, it, it's, yeah, an, it, yeah, it, it, it's an easy model. I, if I want to be a freight agent for a broker, I, I don't need to physically be in their building. I don't need their equipment. I, it, it, this, is, this is a place where you see a lot of independence. And these AB5 type laws, nobody knows what it's going to do to all these different work arrangements. When people say, oh, it'll do this, you don't even know that. The attorneys don't know that. Nobody's going to know it until we start to settle some of these things in court. The fear we have about it's worse than just other states. The federal government has got a big push for this right now. The Department of Labor is trying to put in their own set of guidelines on who's an independent contractor or not. The problem is I've been dealing with this issue for almost 40 years. I've never heard the Department of Labor at all. It's always the IRS or state unemployment or workers comp or, well, now all of a sudden we have a whole new agency that's going to step in and tell us who can be an independent contractor or not. And the problem with the ruling, the PRO Act that they're talking about, or this new Department of Labor ruling is they are so vague that you just if you understand how the government works the more vague they write the rules the more power it gives them to enforce it any way they want to the rules are so vague that the it it basically allows the government to to tell anybody no you're not an independent contractor you're an employee yeah on a it seems like government in- interference in the business. It, it, it really is. It and, like. it, and it's huge. And it's not just trucking. You're familiar with Mike Rowe, right? The dirty jobs guy? Oh, yeah. Love him. Hey, He's a great guy. Doesn't he have an incredible reputation as just kind of being there for the blue collar, just a real down to earth well, guy? Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's like his yeah. whole thing, that's right? That's how he grew up. Yeah. Right. That's how he grew up. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's yeah. his whole thing. Yeah. Dirty jobs. The the people who are out in our economy getting dirty and really doing the work. That That's who he focuses on and right. he highlights them. He posted 70 million independent contractors could lose their business if the government passes the PRO Act. That, that, that's a pretty oh, yeah. big deal. Uh, I re, reposted it and immediately I had people in the trucking industry that, that were saying... Oh, Mike Gross is the big government shill. He's just big corporate. And, and I, that's what I said. I said, are you kidding me? Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I, he, 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 he's, I, I'm, even if I've ever heard the guy, 
He's never come across that way. But never. He's he's for the small guy, small guy starting his own business, saying, "Hey, there's opportunity out there. Get into the what are called, you know, blue collar labor jobs or the manual yeah. labor jobs because there's more opportunity there." And and what most people don't know is that if you read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad, there's a whole chapter on why you would want to go into the service industries and trucking right. is a service industry as well. There's more millionaires in the service category than any other category out there because yes. there's more opportunity there. Yep. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that, that's where you, you kind of just, you just kind of go, I, I why would, I, does everybody just love to give you a hard time? Is that kind of how that works? I think so. I think that must be what it is. <laughs> anyway, it's, a, hey, it's, I just sent you a link. I just, go ahead. I just sent you a link from Forbes on the, uh, what, how Elon Musk, made the phone call, made the post that they just talked about. It, it gives a whole outline from the key facts on how it worked from a Starlink satellite. Really? I got to go read that. Yeah, then. just since it was on Forbes. It was it was on Forbes six hours ago. I just cut, copy and pasted it. I didn't send you the, and here's the, here's, I'll, I'll send this to you too. So, you know, let's see. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so he had a whole, he had a whole approach to it. And I'll send you the, here's the, here's the article from Forbes. And it was in the end, there was a, there's about many, there's several articles on it, but um, uh, on, you know, what he did, because obviously he was doing it for, to, to get promotion, but yeah. Um, yeah, man. Great stuff. Yeah. I love it. Technology just continue to advance. Pretty crazy. All right. Well, um, <laughs> anything else All you right, want to talk about today? No, it's man, time for I'm, you to go. I'm, I'm, I'm fan- oh, one more I'm thing. <laughs> well, well, one more thing, real got? quick. Bring it up. Yeah. We're, we're talking a lot about the CMC, and you and I will both be there. I'll yeah. also, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be in your booth on Friday, the truckstop.com booth, doing my show. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about that. But we also have another event coming up, you and I. We haven't talked about that yet. Another event, you and I. Oh, a TIA. TIA. Absolutely. At the Big Broker yeah. Conference. TIA Capital Ideas in Phoenix on March, not March, April, like 9th, 10th, 11th. No, 10th, sounds 11th, sounds about right. We're gonna, you and I are going to be on stage. And, I, hey, I, Kevin, thank you for bringing this up. I'm very excited about this because nothing warms my heart better than to talk to a bunch of brokers on how they need to work better with carriers to help the carriers create the best profitability possible because they, because as we all know, nothing gets moved without a truck, and a broker is not going anywhere without the carrier saying yes to their freight. And man, the other thing with that is that I couldn't be more excited that you're joining me on stage to talk about this on how to how to best work with carriers. And um, the person who's with us on the panel, who's actually kind of moderating the panel, oh yeah, um, Liz Wayne mm-hmm. was on our Broker Connect show in the past. Which we're getting started again. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So yep. that's yep. You exciting. You know, Liz Wayne holds. She held, she's 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 the queen of Broker Connect. If you forget, <laughs> she holds the record for being on Broker Connect the greatest length of time, two hours and like ten minutes. That's right. When, when we had the when we had the sort of melee between the guy who was like cri- very critical of uh, of 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 the, the industry, and, and there were a lot of people that fired back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great, but it was yeah. the best. One of the best episodes we ever had. Yeah, so I'm I'm looking forward to that. That's uh that's a fun event for me. I haven't been to a TIA TIA event in quite a few years. I used to do them more often, yeah. and uh, I think I'm going to go back to yeah. doing them more often too. But I really enjoy that. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm glad you said yes to it. I'm really glad that that uh, we're going to be able to um, well, just to continue to help the industry work better together. I mean, that's yeah. your goal and my goal is to really help help um, help. In, Brokers and, and carriers work better together, and, and certainly our, our major focus is the carrier, and it's the carrier because without them, we're not going anywhere. And now, let the me carrier ask, is the most important part of the uh, – yeah. Yeah, let me ask you this. You're more familiar with this this event. Is this an event a small carrier should think about going to? Well, um, you could. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to work, if you want to go and maybe find some brokers to do business with, I think, you know, that's – yeah, that, God, you just brought up a great idea. You always talk about – What's the way you can differentiate yourself is to go actually meet the broker. Well, there's 1,800 broker companies at this event. Yeah. And so they're all yeah. from all over the country. If you wanted to, like, find some really great brokers to work with, you could certainly register for the show and come to it. I, I can I can tell you it's, it's, a, it's a very fun event to go to. It's very educational, and they're all right there. So, yeah, that's, that's, God, you, that's a great idea. Do you remember? I mean, you go, go to uh, – go ahead. Um 
Oh, I just uh, I just drew a blank. What was the connected? Wasn't it connected that you guys did? Oh yeah, you are talking about our our, our uh, user conference? Yeah. Yeah, and then I, I did that like half day uh, for small carriers at the connected conference, which was mostly mm-hmm. brokers. But remember, mm-hmm. the small carriers that came for that class. They were like oh, the yeah. most popular people in the building. The brokers were falling oh, no over themselves to go talk to those guys. Well, 100% they were. I remember we had, I think we had 50 carriers, well, 50 attendees. Yeah. I think it was 43 companies because maybe it was 41 companies. But it, when we had all of our social hours and everything, boy, the, the brokers couldn't wait to talk to the carriers to figure out how they could do business with them. Yeah. I mean, that shows you the, the desire for a relationship and, and not, not to screw anybody. And that's never their goal. They, they can't. If, they, they keep screw, if a broker <laughs> screws the carrier, the carrier won't ever use them again. That's right. It's like, so it's like it's a, you, why, why would you ever do that? Right. You know, so, so yeah, so that, that's actually a fantastic idea. Yeah, go to um, uh, Transportation Intermediaries. I think it's .org, it might be, but it's Transportation Intermediaries Association. Uh, and uh, just look for the Capital Ideas Conference, and that's the one in Phoenix in, in April, and see if you can sign up. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, you're, like you say, that's right one of the ways okay. to set yourself apart. 100%. I mean, you want to maximize your rate? Get personal with somebody. There you go. All right. We will let you get on Bye, with buddy. your day. Thanks for a great conversation this morning, and uh, we'll do it again next week. Yes, sir. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Kara. I'll talk to you soon, pal. All right. Brent Hutto from truckstop.com. We, uh, phone lines are open. We don't have any calls. We had several, but they dropped off while we were talking. If you want to jump in now, I will give you about 30 seconds. Let me go back through my notes and see if I have anything to talk about. Uh, if not, I am going to get on with my CMC planning for the day. Got a lot to do. Um, if you're not signed up for the CMC, get signed up. If you are going to be at the Louisville Truck Show, or if there's any chance you can get to the Louisville Truck Show, you really want to come down. And uh, it really, this program is for almost anybody who either is a carrier, wants to be a carrier, wants to grow a fleet, wants to learn how to buy their first truck and do it right, wants to learn how to be profitable. This program now, the, the new CMC 2.0, um, has really everything I've learned in 40 years about running a truck profitably. So now is the time. Get signed up. I know we have less than half the seats available. Uh, We have 200 seats total. I don't know how many we have left right now. Um, Probably sometime this week, I'll start giving you running totals. Uh, I'll try to get some numbers so you know. Let's, uh, all right, we've got some phone calls coming in. Let's get to them. Let's go to Connecticut. Eric, welcome. How are you? Good. Uh, my, my question for you is, uh, I just wanted, uh, I actually wanted to pick your brain as far as my business model. Uh, I have an older truck. I've been thinking of buying a newer one or putting money into the older one. What are your thoughts? I, a little bit of my background is um, I retired. I collect a pension. I decided to go out on the road and drive. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't use any of that pension money for a household income or anything like that. I, I earn my living on the road. Nice. And I invest all that money. Good. My question to you is I need capital, a little more capital to operate. If I keep this older truck, my, my goal is to get it down to Pittsburgh Power, get a few more miles per gallon, stuff like that. Would you recommend me taking a home equity line of credit to do that or maybe take some out of my pension? I'm just looking interest rates and stuff like that. And, in, you go to the bank to borrow money, and their interest rates are crazy. Well, in any market, even when we had those really, really low interest rates for a long time, my first goal is to not borrow money. And the reason for that is okay. that my thought is always keep cost low. If there's a cost yep. that we can eliminate or lower, that means more money ended up in our pocket. So when we borrow money and we now have to pay interest, that interest is a new expense and that money is now gone. And, and I borrow money. 
Uh, but I, I'm very, very careful about it. I'm very, very purposeful about it. Here's the one thing we have to remember. You know, let's say that we want um, something new on one of our trucks, whatever it might be. We spend money on it. We can hold it in our hands. We can enjoy it. We can see it. It might make us more efficient or whatever. When we pay money for interest, I get zero enjoyment out of that money. I didn't (laughs) I didn't buy something that I get to hold and look at or polish or it doesn't make me more efficient or so I get it. There are reasons to borrow money, but I think most people are too fast to borrow it, and they don't realize what that does. And, and we are now in a horrible interest rate environment. Now money yeah. is really expensive. I didn't want to borrow money when it was three and 4%. I'm certainly not borrowing it when it's eight and 10%. I mean, that, that's just, yeah. that, so there are times where we can borrow money, use some leverage to grow the business. To me, that's the only time I will consider borrowing money is is in order to generate growth. But if I don't have any opportunity to generate growth, then I don't want to be borrowing money, not not just to operate. So, no, I would say take the money out of your pension or out of your cash or out of your investments or or out of what you already have, because then the cost of doing the upgrade is only the cost of the upgrade, not the upgrade plus the interest. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, because the, 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 the reason my goal is to, I mean, I've looked at the numbers and I've, I, I'm on the, the Let's Truck app where I track all my numbers. And Good. I know if I can get, if I can get one, if, if I can get five tenths of a mile per gallon, Yes. I could save what I'm going to spend. You know what I mean? That's right. And then, and then and, I was I was looking at purchasing a truck to get maybe a little bit more, and that would actually cover the payment with the amount of miles I do. You know what I mean? I'm yep, kind of exactly. looking that way, but I don't like the I, I I like the truck I'm in right now, so I, my I'm kind of leaning towards keeping that and trying to make this a little better. That that in my opinion, that's almost always less risky. To keep a truck we already know, and and especially if we can look at it and we can predict the improvements. If we do this modification, we'll pick up this much fuel economy, we'll save this much money. Then we can take some of those savings and we could invest in a flow below and we would save this much money. That that to me is a lot less risky than saying, I'm going to buy a new truck and start over. Now, if we're buying, you know, newer 2020 and up i'm getting more and more confident that if we spec things right we will get the fuel economy we we predict but th- there's always more risk in buying newer equipment it's an unknown exactly yep exactly and and where i've been driving this now for three years i know yeah. what i know what it needs to be done i yep. you know I called down. I called down. Talked to one of the guys in the shop, and um, he kind of made some recommendations. And he feels he can get me what I want, fuel mileage wise, just by going over the numbers I've given him and what I'm getting now out of this motor. Good. You know what I mean? Good. He's like, yep. you could probably you could gain quite a bit because the way he explained it to me was the drivers, you know, nine times out of ten make your make get your fuel mileage. There's still a statistic that holds fairly true that the um, driver impacts fuel economy by up to 30%. That's big. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, yep. that's, def- that's huge. All right. Well, I will do that then. Like I said, I, 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 that's the one thing I was going to look at using, you know, where you can get a better interest rate through a home equity line of credit versus a personal loan or something like well, that. Well, you um, can, but if but we... If you th- if mortgage rates right now are in the sevens, which they are, you're going to pay eight or nine percent for a home equity line. Exactly. Yep. And I was looking at what my returns were for my investment. And I mean, short term, they're right around there. Yeah. Uh, obviously, long term, they're, they're a little bit better. So that's where I was kind of confused. Should I just go and try to get a little capital or should I use what I have on hand. I, I, especially in today's environment with the down economy, a lot of uncertainty, uh, I am even less likely to use credit in, a, in an environment like this. It's expensive and there's too much risk. 
Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking my call. That's pretty much all I had. You're welcome. Thanks for the call. Good stuff. Let's go to uh, Alaska. Austin, welcome to the program. Hey, how are you doing? Good. What's on your mind today? Well, I, w- I listened to this. By the way, am I the first guy to ever call from Alaska? Not the first, but uh, I don't get them all that often. Ah, uh, okay. I read this book. It's called Vitted Vision. Or Vitted Vision. Have you ever heard of it? Uh, say that again. It's called Vitted Vision. Vitted? Spell that. V-I-V-I-D. Oh, Vivid. Yeah, yeah. Vivid Business, is that what you said? No, Vision. Oh, but viv- it's about a bit. It's a- vivid Vision. Okay, let me look. No, I have not heard of that book. Let me go see. Vivid Vision book. I got a bunch of weird stuff with just Vivid Vision. Vivid Vision book. Viv- okay. I'm taking a look at it right now. A remarkable tool for aligning your business around a shared vision of the future. Sounds interesting. It's got um, quite a few good ratings. Yeah. One thing that um, it was kind of about really making sure like like you have a business plan for the next three years. And that's kind of what I'm now needing like to take the next step in my business because um, I think one time I called and you said that I'm kind of like in the phase of I'm coasting. I'm not really growing my business. Right. But I'm not, you know, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing better things, but I'm not growing it. And so I guess, you know, three years from now, if you would have asked me what I was going to be doing, I'd probably say, well, I'm still, I'm going to be doing the same thing I am today. So I guess in the next three years, I got to find out what the next vision is in the next three years of my business. And I don't, I don't really know what that is. I don't know what that what that wants to be. So that's kind of what I need to get a plan written up for. Yeah. Well, this sounds like it might be a great place to start. In fact, I'm uh, I'm buying the Kindle version of the book right now. Yeah, it's more based on like having your team. Like you know, like if you have employees, it has a lot about that about how to grow them and to like growing your business. Well, I don't have so, a team, so well let me let, let me address that. Because I one of my it's one of my chapters in my course. It'll be a, a you know, part of the CMC. I have an entire section, chapter, course, all kinds of things on building a winning team and your team does not have to be employees. Your team could just be partnerships you have. I mean, I, I consider Brent Hutto a part of my team here, but he's not an employee. I consider Joel and Henry and Alec a part of my team, but they're not employees. But those are the kind of people, Pittsburgh Power, Mike Beckett from MD Alignment, our, our, our tax guy. I mean, I could go on and on. Uh, it's one of the things we do here as a company. We build really good, strong relationships that benefit our clients. You could do the exact same thing as a small carrier. Your accountant should be part of your team. Your your mechanic or your shop should be a part of your team. If you have a financial planner. So I, I, I haven't read this book yet, but I understand what they're talking about when they're they're saying you should have your vision first and create your vision as the owner and the founder. And then you share that vision with the people around you. So everybody's aligned and moving in the same direction, but they don't have to be employees. Right. Okay, that's a good way to look at it. I'd never actually, I didn't think about it like that. I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, building, you know, my relationships with my brokers, too, could be, Absolutely. Could be part of... Well, Ab- I, I, uh, imagine this, and, uh, you know, think, think about the difference between somebody who simply just calls the broker looking for a load. Well, I see you've got this load posted. I, I'm interested in that. And then the next day they call another broker. We've talked about this. It's a mistake. It's not a good way to run the business. What if, on the other hand, we had three to five good brokers that we worked with? What if we just went and took them to lunch or dinner and spent some time with them and shared our vision? This is what I want my company to look like. This is my vision for my company. This is the kind of freight I want. These are the kind of relationships I want. When you share that vision with your with your broker partners, doesn't that empower them to go find freight to work for you? That's what brokers want to do. Brokers want to move freight. And moving freight is complicated yeah. and time-consuming. So anytime 
a broker believes, boy, if I if I really partnered with this guy, with Austin, this carrier, he's going to cover these loads for me and I won't have to worry about them. That's that's the holy grail for them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and that's a good thing to look at because actually, like, one of the things I really want to focus my business on is is coming to Alaska. Like, I, I this is the most beautiful place. Yeah, to it is. Drive. And I, I want to focus my business more towards, like, staying above, like, the, the I-70 corridor and, like, going to Canada and doing all that because, like, there's a lot of people that don't want to really do that. Right. And I feel like I could take a lot of advantage of that, yep. even doing wide, heavy loads, you know, escorts, all that. Like, And, I mean, actually, there's a broker that lives here in, a lot, in Anchorage, and I'm going to probably try to meet with him while I'm here. And There you go. Kind of... Because I've worked with him getting loads up here, so yeah, that's kind of like my goal in the next three years is really focus my business on like not just booking you know coast to coast freight, like kind of finding a knit group of agents to work with and Excellent. say, hey, this is where I want to go, this is what what I want to do. Um, so I'm getting a lot out of you know all this programming you've been doing, and so good, it's great. Like I I feel really satisfied. All um, right, keep it up. That's all I had. I just. One of the, and, yeah, thank you. And thank uh, you for the book recommendation. The All right, we will see you then. Let's go to Florida. Tony, welcome. Good eye, Mike. <laughs> I like that idea about the five good brokers, except the only thing is there isn't five good brokers out. I'm kidding. All right, kidding. Yeah, had to get that out there. I know, I know. You got it in. Kevin, can you drop that TIA? Update again. I missed it. Let me go look it up. It's somewhere around April 9th, but I'll give you the um, the, the dates itself here. And while you're busy doing that, I'll uh, I'll try and sneak something else in there about brokers. Um, I don't currently have an I hate brokers uh, shirt. So um, somebody, uh, Paul, if you want to make me one, I might take a hundred dollars to wear it at that event. <laughs> what? Oh, no. Oh, boy. My girlfriend's calling okay. me. I'm in trouble. Okay. Here are the dates. It's called the Capital Ideas Conference, and it's April 10th to the 13th in Phoenix. Ah, that sounds good. And and that one sure is, trucking. is not members only, so you do not have to be a TIA member to go to this conference. And I, I will tell you, every time I've been to a TIA conference, and I, over the years I've tried to talk about them and tell, you know, owner-operators if I'm going to be at one speaking, um, every time small carriers come out, they are like the bell of the ball. All the brokers want to talk to them, want to take them out to dinner. Want to, it, it's pretty incredible to watch. Uh, what did you say about being a member on that one? On this, but some of their, like they have another uh, event coming up in September, but that one you actually have to be a member of TIA to go to that one. This one you do not have to be a member. Yeah, all right. Good. I'll plan on shooting up there. Um, you were talking about uh, home equity loans and stuff, uh, and that sort of joggled my mind before I called bullshit on your on your direct line <laughs> profit um, uh, formula later. Don't worry. There's people out there that are expecting this of me, but uh, important things first. What about mortgaging or selling the property in Florida and buying a truck cash? That's extreme. Well, but, wait, 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 hold on, because you, you said two things and it didn't make sense together. You said mortgaging or selling, two very, very different things. If you mortgage it, you're borrowing money, and that's what I'm trying to avoid it in, in this market. Selling it to raise capital, totally different. Now you're truly paying cash for the truck. If you mortgage something and then think you're paying cash for the truck, you're not. So it's not a good idea to take out a home equity uh, line of credit to pay off debt or something? Not in today's market because the money's too expensive. If you would have gotten, you know, borrowed the home equity money when it was 2 and 3%, then that makes sense. But borrowing money at 8, mm-hmm. 9, 10%, no. I, I, it's not a good idea in my opinion. If I just go ahead and sell? Now selling uh, is different. What would be the best yes. way of getting the most I can out of a of you know a tennis club like this that we have on five acres? <sighs> well, 
marketing. I mean, you, you just you you need to find the person who wants that property the most and is willing to pay the most for it. And unfortunately, we're not in a great real estate market right now. But it's not horrible. Real estate prices themselves have not dropped all that much at all. It's just getting harder and harder to find buyers. And I'm glad we're on the air for this. Um, are you ready? Are you ready for this next one? Uh, what about let's say pilot truck stop well forget that i hate pilot loves truck stop even though they screwed me because this right here is like the perfect location it's there's a walmart distribution center where trucks are parked on the road and getting towed because there's no fuel um like how does that happen like how do they select their locations there is a pilot well, uh, pretty uh, close to here already. Yeah, so but it could use a love, and it could use a TA for sure. TA. So, so yeah, and and TA probably knows that, and TA is is good at finding locations, and they know what they're looking for. They know how much traffic. They've got all their criteria. Here's the bigger issue. The bigger issue isn't where do they want to build a truck stop. It's where will they be allowed to build a truck stop. Every time somebody wants hmm. to build a new truck stop, everybody fights it. Nobody wants truck stops in their neighborhood. Hmm. That's one of the bigger challenges, is not finding the locations. It's finding the locations that you can get approval. And would it already have to be zoned commercial, or could it yes. be a residential it, it, with ag exemption? Oh, no. No, no, no. They'd have to get that changed. I basically, that's what my homestead is, basically residential with ag exemption. Um, exemptions and you can do a lot with that but i can't build a truck stop on that property Mm -hmm. all right now for the uh direct line income statement you you said that if you get more revenue uh that does not trickle down to the bottom line i'm calling half bullshit on that well before you tell me i know where you're going remember (laughs) how i explained my 50 percent rule Fixed cost come out. I know. Out. Yes, I know that. that fixed that's cost why it's only come out. Half bullshit. What I used to do, uh, now a mathematician would call full bullshit, because if I say I want to pay you a truck order not used, and you have no expense, you're sitting at home asleep, and, and $250 comes in, that does transfer straight to oh, the bottom but line. So on, only, be- that, only because... That's just a penalty. I don't have to go work for that money. I don't have to go spend anything for that money. But if that were truly $50 added to a load, I still have all my expenses to get there, pick up the load and deliver the load. So when you use something like a truck ordered, not used, that's an exception. Yeah, you're talking about new work. You're not talking about just... Not just having new to revenue. Do anything. You're right. talking about having to drive, having to find the load, having to put fuel well, in the it, truck. It, right. Um, and and that, the reason does... the reason we use this a lot is because of this idea of more work, more work, more revenue. I'll do anything I can to get more revenue, so I'll drive 85 miles an hour to get to that load faster. That that's where this yeah. whole thing falls apart. But in their mind, they think, oh, well, when I slow down, I save three hundred dollars on this trip or whatever on this week or month. But right. if I it, it's easy for me to go generate another three hundred dollars by driving faster. The problem is you don't need to generate three hundred. You need to generate nine hundred now to be even. That's the concept we're the trying way, to this, get people to understand. This phone system, uh, you're you're in an auditorium when you when you call on the app, uh, but on on uh, listening without calling in, you're you're your normal self. But this the phone system still has you in an auditorium. It, uh, what for- I used to do once you uh, once you know that you're profitable. Tell me what you think of this. I used to uh, make it a game to put, you know, put as much fuel into the truck and and still be efficient. Uh, Nobody likes putting fuel in the truck. Oh, it's expensive. Uh, I'm not making enough money. But I knew that every dollar I put into fuel, I would get whatever, uh, you know, a a dollar twenty of of profit out of it. So I'd I would reverse psychology myself into into not waiting to be able to get fuel i loved getting fuel well good so that must mean that the you know through it goes through the calculation and it goes um whatever the the percentage is up through into 
the uh, the bottom line. Correct. But it's be- because I'm profitable. I'm I'm not losing money. Um, but yeah, the fuel is a direct expense. But but it it will help yeah. you if you are profitable. Like the more fuel you put in, you'll 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 just profit more. Yeah. All, every time you hear us talk about this top line, bottom line difference, it's almost always going to be around fuel and speed. And, and there are other exceptions where that wouldn't be the right number. We have some fixed costs that, well, all fixed costs, you're going to pay that whether you run or not. But it's the variable cost we, we can affect by the way we drive. And that's really where the, the top line, yeah. bottom line comes in. That just all of a sudden started sounding uh, really more clear. I don't know what you just did, but uh, keep doing it. I, yeah, you don't just go ahead and buy fuel at the at Pilot. <laughs> I love to pick on Pilot, or uh, you'll go to the you know the best fuel location. Use your discounts. You'll you'll uh, put the tail uh, with the wind. You'll haul expensive freight. You know you'll do all the things that you're used to doing, but and not not mind fuel anymore because you know that that's gonna. Uh, that's just going to double itself into your profit Yep. or more. Yep, exactly. All right, Tony, we are going to wrap this up for the day. Good stuff as always. Uh, I'm going to get on with my day. We will see you back here tomorrow for the Power Hour. Be safe, be profitable, be fit and healthy. Always do the hard work and master the journey.